Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Steve Cheney, the CEO of the American Security Project, and we've got a really delightful program for you this afternoon. Let me talk about the American Security Project here for just a second. Founded in 2005 by some folks you might know, Kerry, Hagel, Hart, and Rudman. And the thought at the time was that they would take topical issues and use a national security perspective on each one of those issues. So they built a board that had an equal number of Republican Democrats, but more so they had eight flag officers, three and four star, a couple from each service. And that has existed until to date. Uh, our now chairwoman is Governor Christine Todd Whitman. She took over last fall. And our president is Nelson Cunningham, who's the president and CEO of McLarty and Associates. And now we still retain those flag officers on the board, although our board has expanded somewhat dramatically to about 20 to include a number of business folks. Um, our intent is to take topical issues and, and really talk the national security side to these. So we don't take a political side to it. We don't endorse a party. We don't endorse a candidate. Uh, however, we will criticize a policy if we feel it's in the national interest. Um, so let me talk a little bit about today. I'll start off. Everything's on the record. We are going to uh, tweet this. We will blog it. Uh, we will tape it. We'll have it up on our website tomorrow. So if you're worried about taking accurate notes, you can redo it again all tomorrow. Um, I want to thank a few people in advance. One is the Columbia University Press, who helped sponsor the food today. Uh, another is my own staff. We've got a number of interns who help us produce this today. And Matthew, of course, our photographer and sound man, and a number of folks who are involved in our website. And of course, not the least of which is Dr. Sam Brown. Now, he's told me this isn't a plug about his book, that in fact, we are going to talk about Obama's national security policy and his assessment of that. But nonetheless, I'm going to plug his book. The uh, Faces of Power, if you've not read it, it is just an amazing uh, book on the history of foreign policy since World War II. And it, it's not short, but you've added several hundred pages here recently with this third edition. So I encourage you to look at it, go online, buy it. Uh, it's a scholarly work. work. Now, Sam is no stranger to foreign policy. And uh, as you can tell from his bio, I'm sure you've seen it, he's, he's had more jobs than I've had duty stations as a Marine. Um, worked at Rand, Brookings, Carnegie, the Belfer Center. Um, also served as special assistant in the Department of Defense in uh, ISA. He was a special assistant in policy planning in the Department of State. He's taught at Harvard, Brandeis, Sice, Columbia, University of Chicago, UCLA, and SMU. Um, so Sam, you've, you've been around the bend a number of times, and he's got uh, by my count, at least 12 books. Does this make 13? I think so, yeah. This makes number 13 that he's, that he's authored, and they're all just wonderful, wonderful books. But we're going to talk a little bit about today about Obama's national security policy, and he's, he started off by saying that uh, he's going to argue that Obama's national security policy resembles those of Reagan and George W. Bush in their second terms more than any of his other predecessors. And he will assess the implications of Obama's evolving grand strategy for his successors. And I found it really interesting you picked those particular Republicans to, to compare and contrast to Obama. So Sam, we're, I'm delighted to have you here. I think we're going to have a great afternoon. And I'm going to turn it over to him for about uh, 10 or 15 minutes of comments, then we'll hold a little dialogue. Then I'll open it up to the audience and we hopefully can have a dialogue with you. So Sam, the floor is yours. Thanks, Steve, very much. Uh, and also thanks for Columbia University Press for cooperating with you on uh, giving me this opportunity to talk about my and your favorite subject these days, I'm sure, and that is uh, Obama's foreign policies. Um, and my purpose here today is to encourage a serious debate and dialogue about President Obama's basic approach to national security. We still have another two years of his presidency, and the legacy uh, of Obama will profoundly affect the security and well-being of the American people and of billions around the world Surely. Uh, for generations to come. So the subject is not my book. The subject is, as Steve mentioned, uh, Obama's national security policy. Uh, the findings about the administration's national security policy uh, that I've made and included in doing the research for the book is what I want to talk with you about. But the book is only a vehicle 
for presenting sure. uh, these findings or tentative findings and the evidence, uh, a vehicle for encouraging uh, the crucially needed serious dialogue. Uh, serious uh, in what sense? Well, neither of the two levels that we've been exposed to recently, the level of competing assertions and critiques of love of country and patriotism, not that level, nor the level of partisan, political, and personalistic invective, uh, gotcha, pouncing on uh, inept statements and surface contradictions of the, pe of the president and also the president's uh, critics. I'd like to uh, encourage a serious discussion in posing and attempting to answer the following questions. What importance and priority does Obama give to national security as compared to other interests and values? <coughs> what does President Obama consider to be the principal national, national security threats, the most dangerous ones, the most urgent ones, and their causes? What is President Obama's philosophy about the use of force? The use of force as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy. When is it legitimate? When is it wise? When is it necessary? What about the role of nuclear weapons? And how have these basic assumptions about national security affected the administration's policy towards Russia, especially uh, the aggression against the Ukraine, toward China, particularly in uh, China's moves in the South China and uh, East China Seas, terrorism, toward Al-Qaeda and IS, jihadism, the definition of the enemy, who are we really fighting against, ending the wars in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, dealing with Iran on nukes, but also many other grievances we have against Iran, Israel, North Korea, and Obama's administration's attitudes towards democracy, human rights, uh, R2P, responsibility to protect, and how that has driven policies or interfered with sound policies toward Libya, Egypt, Syria, etc. So let's have a dialogue about this. We're obviously, we're not going to cover all of these issues in sufficient depth, but I'd like to have that dialogue be within an, an appreciation of uh, the context of U.S. foreign policy since World War II. I'd like you to think along with me as to how Obama's struggles with these issues are or are not substantially more ambivalent and any less coherent than the way other presidents have dealt with national security issues. We now know, of course, on the basis of declassified records and deliberations at the highest levels, on the basis of memoirs of the principal decision makers, we now know quite a bit about the extent to which a lot of the policies and crisis decisions we now invoke as models of, de of decisiveness, models of tough-mindedness, backbone, strategic wisdom, how in reality, however, Crucial national de uh, security decisions of uh, past administrations were the product of intensive debate in which often the policies that were chosen were regarded as foolish by some of the president's advisors, were judgment calls, huge gambles about which the president, although usually not admitting this in public, about w which the president himself was very ambivalent and could have decided differently. Some samples, okay. The, de the decision to use the atomic bomb against Japan before the Soviets got into the war and before we let the Japanese keep their emperor. These issues on which Truman's two principal national security advisors, 
Secretary of War Stimson and Secretary of State Jimmy Burns strongly disagreed. Okay. The Truman Doctrine, adamantly opposed by who? Adamantly opposed by Kennan, who wanted the Marshall Plan approach to be the principal grand strategy for containment, not the Truman Doctrine. Truman's recognition of Israel in 1948 over the objections of most of his foreign policy and national security advisors, including Secretary of State Marshall, who threatened to publicly resign over the issue. Truman's insistence on limiting the Korean War to Korea itself, even though the North was acting as a proxy of the Soviet Union, and even though the Chinese directly intervened, the issue which led to MacArthur's dismissal. Eisenhower's refusal to intervene on behalf of the French in Indochina, overriding the very strong recommendation that we do so by the, by the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral uh, Bradford. The Suez Crisis, Eisenhower's slapping down of the British, the French, and the Israelis over their use of military power against Nasser when Nasser nationalized the Suez Canal. Eisenhower's refusal to confront the Soviets over the Russian, uh, Russians' uh, brutal repression of the uprising in Hungary. The Formosa St Straits crisis. Eisenhower and Dulles' public threats to use nuclear weapons against the Chinese while secretly insisting that Chiang Kai-shek demilitarize the offshore islands because that was too provocative. The Berlin crisis of 1958-59, Eisenhower's public exchange of nuclear threats with Khrushchev, while diffusing the crisis by secretly ordering U.S. diplomats to finesse the confrontation over the Soviet ploy to give the East Germans control over the Autobahn access to Berlin. The Bay of Pigs fiasco, Kennedy's refusal to use military force to prevent Castro from smashing the uh, exile invasion, and even the Cuban Missile Crisis, Kennedy's efforts to slow down and de-escalate the crisis, pulling back the quarantine line, no retalia uh, retaliation against SAM sites for shooting down the U-2, and the final quid pro quo deal, the no invasion pledge, the dismantling of Turkish missiles, which were strongly objected to by Dean Acheson, Henry Kissinger, and others. Kennedy's publicly voiced ambivalence about intervening in Vietnam, McNamara's change of mind and heart about the Vietnam War, Clark Clifford's mobilization of pressure to get LBJ and increasingly anguished LBJ to try to end the war, the Nixon-Kissinger detente policies toward the Soviet Union, very controversial within the Reagan wing of the Republican Party. Nixon, the Nixon-Kissinger escalations of the Vietnam War, mining Haiphong, saturation bombing of the North, possibly provoking the Soviets, the end game uh, of the war. Very, very controversial moves. Kissinger's efforts to look neutral in the Yom Kippur War. Reagan's effort to revive the Cold War over objections by our NATO allies, including Margaret Thatcher, who were eager to expand commercial relations with the Soviets and East Europeans. Reagan turned around in this, was turned around in this by George Shultz. Reagan's SDI. Most defense and national security officials privately were skeptical about this, but decided to humor him. Then the irony of his commitment to SDI preventing the nuclear disarmament agreement with Gorbachev, which the Hawks in the Reagan administration were very fearful he was about to negotiate. All of these were very controversial issues at the time. The journalists sometimes picked it up, sometimes they didn't. Okay. Reagan's caving in on Lebanon in response to the terrorist attack on the Marine barracks at the Beirut airport. Um, Reagan's uh, famous statement, I've pounded some walls trying to determine what we do in response to terrorists, where I don't, I don't necessarily know who the targets should be. False claims by Reagan about never negotiating with terrorists. And of course, there was the arms for hostage deals in connection with Iran-Contra. And despite attacks against, Gaddafi, against Gaddafi's compound in Libya in uh, retaliation for the disco bombing of Germany, Reagan 
a professed admirer of Teddy Roosevelt, rather than talking softly and carrying a big stick, more often than not, tended to talk loudly and carry a twig. Okay. Now this history of intense disagreements, of tense controversies, ambivalence, and changes of course in national security policy is easily forgotten in the heat of the contemporary debates. Only in retrospect, with the passage of time and simplifying complexities, do our presidents really stand unambiguously that steady and tall? At the time, of course, they were ridiculed in cartoons and debates in the Congress and so on. But in retrospect, they look big and tall. For the dilemmas have been profound, have been essential. Even in the simpler times of the Cold War and ambivalence in regard to our competing and often contradictory interests, the major criticism directed against uh, Obama, his ambivalence, is more often than not entirely appropriate. So with such pre-Obama history as background, and I'm not going to necessarily concentrate on Reagan or Bush and their second administration, though we can get back to that. Sure. Okay, but this is background, which takes up about 650 pages of my nearly 800-page <laughs> book. Okay. Let me briefly summarize for you my overall, quote, findings, unquote, about Obama's approach to national security. His philosophy, how he has implemented his beliefs, and what we can expect of him during the remainder of his presidency. I'm just going to give you a kind of a brief capsule uh, characterization, and then we can open it up sure. for discussion. First, <clears throat> there should be no doubt that Obama, like all of his post-war predecessors in the Oval Office, from Truman to George W. Bush, no doubt that he has been completely dedicated to serving what I call the irreducible national interests. That is the survival and safety of the country, the economic well-being of its people, and the blessings of liberty. You think he which loves part the country, the right? Yeah. Well, <laughs> all, of the, all of the presidents, although they have been sure. vilified by their opponents, have themselves Absolutely. felt that this was their obligation, this was their imperative. Okay. Obama's hesitancy, his ambivalence, are attributable not to an ideological pacifism, but rather to his standard um, uh, just war criteria, uh, uh, to the standard just war criteria. And with respect to the use of force, the, uh, the basic philosophy of the use of force, Obama's own reflections in accepting the Nobel Peace Prize um, have been shown by his actions in office to be the best guide as to how he would deal with this most profound national security question, when to use force. And I just want to remind you of that. Um, and let me see if I can find that now. <clears throat> so you're going to get your glasses right there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay. Um, he says in his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, there will be times when nations, acting individually or in concert, will find the use of force not only necessary, but morally justified. This is not a pacifistic statement on his part. I make this statement mindful of what Martin Luther King Jr. said in, his, in the same ceremony here years ago, quoting him, violence never brings permanent peace, it solves no social problem, it merely creates new and more complicated ones. As someone, says Obama, who stands here as a direct consequence of Dr. King's life's work, I am living testimony to the moral force of nonviolence. <laughs> I know there is nothing weak, nothing passive, nothing naive 
in the creed and lives of Gandhi and King. But, as head of a state sworn to protect and defend my nation, I cannot be guided by their examples alone. I face the world as it is and cannot stand idle in the face of threats to the American people. For make no mistake, evil does exist in the world. A nonviolent movement could not have halted Hitler's armies. Negotiations cannot convince Al-Qaeda's leaders to lay down their arms. To say that force may sometimes be necessary is not a call to cynicism. It is a recognition of history, the imperfections of man, and the limits of reason. Now this is, this is a basic philosophical position. And I think it has been shown to animate some of his decisions. And his decisions have been remarkably consistent with the basic just war principles. Okay. That the cause must be just. Okay. That the use of force, if we are to engage in it, must be proportional. That is, the evil that war brings must be a necessary evil, okay? But it should not overwhelm the evil of war itself, uh, the, 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 the evil, rather, of peace and non, uh, uh, and, and non compliance. Uh, it should be the last resort after other options not necessarily have been exhausted, but have been thoroughly explored. Okay. It should emanate from proper authority, consultations with the President, consultations with the Congress, approval by the Congress if possible, also the proper authority of international organizations, multinational organizations. These do not constitute a veto on the use of force, but as much as possible, the use of force should be consonant with proper authority. And adherence to the Geneva Principles, the laws of war against targeting and attacking non-combatants and civilians. Uh, these uh, basic principles, these basic criteria, I suggest if we look at his decisions, have been the reasons for hesitancy, but have also been the reasons for choosing certain courses of action and deciding he's going to refrain from other courses of action, including troops on the ground, which we can talk about more in detail. Okay. Another uh, finding is that like his immediate predecessor, George W. Bush, Clinton has come to believe that the principal current... Obama or Clinton? Uh, uh, pardon? Obama or Clinton? Obama. Okay. Yeah. Obama, like his, his predecessor, like his immediate predecessor, George Bush, has come to share Bush's belief okay, that the principal current threat to the safety and security of the American people is terrorism. It didn't start out that way, but Obama's policies have evolved in that direction. And that other objectives in the irreducible national interest also, the global spread of democracy and human rights and basic world order. Other objectives, while still definitely in the national interest to pursue, must be subordinated to the prevention of terrorist acts against the homeland. Immediate terrorism prevention strategies must give priority, therefore, to disabling and destroying the terrorist operatives, leaders, and bases. And this means U.S. partnerships, at least for the near term, are going to have to be with some not very savory bedfellows. This is a, a, a realization that Bush came to, particularly near the end of his second term. Okay in which he subordinated his freedom agenda to all kinds of arrangements with various unsavory allies. But it is also the evolution that we see in Obama's policy. The second half of Obama's second term is very similar to the second half of Bush's second term. But whether and when 
any of these strategies will again involve nation building, counterinsurgency, boots on the ground, regime change operations. As of February 25th, 2015, as of today, are more open questions in the Obama administration than they have been at any time during the past six years. Okay. More open questions today, even with respect to boots on the ground, even with respect to nation building, even with respect to regime change. Uh, so these, my friends, are my basic findings about Obama's national security policy. I submit that anything more definitive is an oversimplification, a caricature, and not an accurate characterization. Well, Sam, great, great comments. Thank you. Uh, uh, I, I can't resist the temptation when you dangle the candy of two Republican administrations, two-term presidents, and you talk about the second term, and here we have a Democrat. Second term, of course, he's here now, incumbent. But when you talk use of force and national interest, um, domestic policy versus foreign policy, does it not seem during their first term the concentration is a bit more on the domestic side now. The aberration, of course, to this would certainly be George Bush with 911. He was faced with that immediately. But, but they f face more on the domestic side, looking towards the election coming up four years later. And then once that's done, he's lame duck. He can go full force on foreign policy and concentrate on that and use that as the legacy. Do you see any comparisons or contrast between Obama, Reagan, uh, and yeah. Bush on, the, on that score. Yeah, Reagan, if you recall, despite his campaigning on supply, for supply-side economics, reducing government expenditures, reducing taxes, letting the economy take off as a result of this, almost immediately deferred to Weinberger's uh, uh, defense budget proposals that uh, uh, very substantially increased defense expenditures over Stockman's vociferous objections to this, that, Mr. President, what about the domestic situation? Okay. Uh, Reagan deferred to Weinberger. Uh, even before Weinberger had a bit of bill of particulars, we wanted to, in order to have a full court press against the Soviets, indicate to them that we were going to spend whatever is necessary to very vigorously prosecute the Cold War. A revival of the Cold War. Now, it was in Reagan's second term okay, when uh, the economy wasn't doing that well okay, that he was responsive to um, suggestions from within his own administration also that perhaps the United States was engaged uh, in uh, a kind of an overstretch uh, reaction to the Soviets. And we see that the Soviets perhaps also uh, were acting the way Kissinger said that they would react. And that is very constrained uh, in uh, what they could allocate to national security affairs. So the second term of Reagan's was motivated more by getting the domestic economy back on track and engaging in serious arms control negotiations than it was during the first term. So, so do you, I see that as a contrast to what's going on now. Do you not, whereas the first term of Obama was Obamacare, it was the economic crisis, but now that that's somewhat behind us, the, uh, he's more focused on the foreign policy side. So that's a flip to what Reagan Yeah, did. right. Well, I think in, the, in terms of the sequence there with Reagan, the sequence was, you're correct, uh, somewhat of a flip. But the point that I was making with respect to Reagan is that the constraints and the ambivalence uh, that restricted uh, his vigorous use of force okay, were very much the same that have restricted uh, Obama's. Obama. Now, with respect sure. to second term, there we see Bush and Obama uh, similar. very similar. Okay. And, and uh, interestingly enough, of course, that similarity with respect to national security policy had a lot to do 
with the basic approach of uh, Bob Gates as Secretary of Defense. Uh, and then also uh, Hadley when he became National sure. Security Advisor. Sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a great dialogue, and I want to open up to involve you all in it, too. We're gonna, we've got a roving mic, and what I want to do is if you just kind of stick your hand up, and I'll pick on you. If you. When you get the mic, if you could please tell us who you are and kind of hold your question down to a short one or a little dialogue, and, and then we'll go from there. Yes, sir, right here in front. Uh, memories are short. And you are? I don't know if this is working. It's working. Okay, memories are very short. And uh, maybe if you ask Obama, which country in the world did he first, first visit? Maybe you don't go get the right answer. Mm -hmm. Do you remember what it was? Egypt. No. No. Turkey. Oh, Turkey. Turkey. That's Turkey. right. Okay, you got Why? it. Why? Why? Okay. Because somebody wrote an article. I, he said, don't let the Arab countries be angry with you. Go to Turkey, because Turkey is the head of the Arab countries. Turkey was the head of the Arab countries during the Khalifat, the Osmani Khalifat. So after that, he went to Cairo and made the speech in the university. Yeah. Hosni Mbarak didn't even bother to attend it. And he said, I am going to go to Iran and talk to them directly and convince them not to continue. That's very early in the... Now, the ignorance is that obviously the people here don't even read the constitution of the Muslim Brothers. So when the revolution in Egypt of 2011 came, Hillary Clinton, uh, uh, the, the ambassador of the United States in Egypt and uh, the senator, the Republican senator, what's his name? Escape. McCain. McCain. <laughs> they all went and talked to the Muslim brothers. They didn't even read the constitution of the Muslim brothers. And in Boston, when these fellows from Russia committed the terrible crime at the end of the race, and then they were known. Obama came out and said, I can't believe two young Americans, like any Americans, how can they commit that? They're not Americans. They're Muslims, period. And so, so your point is... They, they, have, they have a passport, but they're not Americans. Right. The ignorance... Right. The first, the constitution of the Muslim Brothers is 50 principles. I met uh, the fellow so, uh, who founded the uh, Muslim uh, Brothers, uh, Hassan al-Banna, uh, twice you have a in question? Egypt. He had a great memory. And now uh, Obama makes, they are American. They are not Americans. The first, they, there are 50 principles in the constitutions of the Muslim Brothers. And, and your the question, first one... Your question or recommendation? No nationality. Yeah. No nationality. Your, your actually alliance is to the Khalifat. Right. Now, what, what the immediate thing yeah. I, I, I want to question, because I don't understand, how come the American nation with their uh, the carriers in the Mediterranean cannot bombard more this terrible ISIS. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> I, I will uh, let the gentleman's question um, stand as an expression of his discontent with American policy. Sure. Yeah. Um, but I'm not sure that I have an answer yeah, I, 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 neither of us are here, I think, to defend necessarily the defense policy of the Obama administration or, or why they're doing what they're doing, uh, other than to say to get a good look and see what Ash Carter is trying to do in terms of getting everybody together and looking, studying the situation with John Allen and others that are over there that, that lends to the use of force in regards to ISIL and ISIS, and, uh, and that's an ongoing problem, um, and it's not going to be resolved soon or any time in the next 
six months, next couple of years either. So um, I, I, I can't necessarily answer your question about why we're not using aircraft carriers or not. I defer that to, uh, to Ash Carter. I am ready yeah. to kindly yeah. forgive the yeah. arrogance right here. the ignorance. You cannot forgive the ignorance. The, uh, I mean, no, 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 <laughs> right here in the corner. <laughs> right here, right there. Uh, thank you. This is uh, exciting. I have, I have a lot of things I'd like to say, too, but I'll uh, confine myself to one. With your history on national security strategies, I I'm sort of curious about the evolution in, in the language where we try to compare going alone versus partnerships. In this national security strategy, strategy it's, uh, uh, Obama said, we, we prioritize collective action. And I look back over the history, remember burden sharing and uh, the terms have been co cooperative action, coalitions of the willing, partnerships. Could you talk about does the, the language in this year's national security strategy, strategy uh, is that different from what has been talked about before in trying to bring other people to fight with us? I don't sense a major difference. I think the, the, it's not emphasized as much. Um, it, there's a kind of a, a uh, ritualistic invocation of um, cooperative arrangements of going with other people uh, of uh, multilateral approaches but uh, apart from that rhetoric appears to me the Obama administration has uh, carved out for itself itself the option of unilateral unilateral action uh, if it doesn't get uh, cooperative, uh, well, that depends what we mean by preemptive action. Um, uh, you say carved out. Does that mean excluded? No, or no, in included. No, included, included. I don't find that uh, it has denied itself uh, preemptive action. Do you find that in well, the? Mm? Well, W explicitly included it, where that wasn't in there. Right. But interestingly enough, although he explicitly included it, apart from some early reactions, uh, mainly from the scholarly community, about preemption, uh, the democratic national security uh, establishment did not challenge him on that. Recognized, along with uh, George Schultz, during the Reagan administration that preemptive action if you're dealing with terrorists might sometimes be warranted and it's interesting that you don't find the Obama administration in any of its statements explicitly rejecting preemptive action over on this side right back there Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Joe McKinney. I'm an independent supply chain consultant. Thanks, I've done Joe. some work with DHS, with uh, Europe, and so forth and so on. It, you asked early on what you thought um, uh, Obama, or what people might think, was Obama's major concern, I guess, in terms of foreign policy. And I'll posit the, uh, the, the idea that because of his particular upbringing, uh, having occurred overseas for a substantial period of time and the rest of the time in Hawaii, which is pretty far distant from the continental United States and what we think of here as, as American and so forth, that American arrogance in the world is what he has been concerned about at every step and wants to demonstrate our inclusion of other people's ideas, opinions, and so forth, and the NSA crisis really sort of took the, um, you know, rug out from underneath him on that subject. But, you know, immediately after 9-11, uh, Customs and Border Patrol is where I was doing some work, and we were imposing lots of, con lots of requirements on other countries in terms of inspecting containers before they came to the U.S., so forth and so on. So I posited the question, I said, well, are we willing to do the same? And what I was told very explicitly was, there's no concept of any reciprocity. And I think this is the, um, the issue that he's been trying to deal with, and at this point he's um, gotten away from 
uh, needing to be concerned about that and needing to be more concerned about making the right things happen uh, that with the results that we need as a nation and if people are willing to come along with us. I mean, ISIS is fortunately creating many enemies by attacking everybody that they can. Uh, and they're doing some of the hard work on the ground uh, in some horrible, horrible ways. But, um, you know, when he came in, he was trying to end wars. And he's been handed this requirement that in order to be effective, he's going to have to elevate, you know, some armed conflict in one way or another. And it's not where he wanted to be. But, you know, when you get to the office, you start to do what you need to do, no matter what you said beforehand. Sam? Yes, I think you're correct in your characterization. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, uh, he has uh, been required and has taken on that requirement of being commander in chief that role of the president more than he ever aspired to or thought he would have to. But it appears to me that he has done that. He hasn't shirked that. And this is where it appears to me there are a lot of caricatures that are in the debate about Obama which don't conform to the reality. Now one may agree or disagree with particular moves that he has made, but the notion that somehow He's not a national security president. He doesn't care for that. Uh, he's uh, only really interested in nation building at home and so on. Those are caricatures. You know, Joe, I, I can talk to the issue of reciprocity, having just come off a study group with the International Security Advisory Board at State on SOFA agreements. And one of the biggest hindrances to us having SOFAs with countries is reciprocity. And we very rarely grant reciprocity to those countries to have their forces in our country, whether they're studying here or going through training schools or whatever, uh, not be um, restricted by our laws and be coming under the laws of their own country, which we do routinely for ours that are going to other places. So uh, you can pull up that study, by the way, online. It's on our website. It's on State's website as well. Uh, Walt Slocum and and I and a couple others put that together. But, but the point to your, what you said, is the arrogance of the Americans. Hey, we can go in and do whatever we want, but you can't do whatever you want, e even with allies. And so it's kind of a, a curious thing, and uh, it's something that needs to be worked, certainly needs to be worked in this administration and future administrations. So, uh, good point. Parallel, perhaps to Eisenhower, who had a very good understanding of where, what America could accomplish. Uh, yep. And was very concerned about things big time and that's not a natural association no no it's not no it's not yes sir right here on the right uh harry blaney uh center of international policy and uh, former diplomat uh, i'd like to question one of your basic just one of your basic uh ca characterizations of uh, obama being like uh the predecessors. Um, it seems to me that your quote uh, of um, Obama in his Nobel speech uh, gave a perspective in view of the world and of his own role that was qualitatively different from any of his predecessors that you have. Because he recognized the ambiguity and the complexity of the, thing, of the environment at that time uh, that he saw and had to face. He already was, in effect, president. And that changes you, and I agree with that. And much of your analysis I agree with. But I think his uh, reactions and policies are, um, how to describe it, antithetical to the approach, let's say, that Bush too took to the world and his understanding of it and the complexity and change. The biggest thing that I think the president seems to me to have is that he recognizes that things are going very fast, that complexity is there, ambiguity and all the rest in which you have yourself uh, characterized in ways that uh, we have not before. And his problem, and the problem of the country, is that uh, where he wants to go to recognize the reality of the landscape and the way our politics are going, of, uh, if you would, of simplicity in uh, corrosive uh, views that are wrong-headed often uh, is preventing America from really recognizing what Obama does already. 
in that way, I think he is uh, a, a different kind of president that we have seen. Uh, so I would challenge that in your comments. And the only other, other point I want to thought is that I think that his world, as seen in the last uh, national security document, uh, seems to try to reflect some of that, but has not been understood, certainly on the Hill. Thank you for the comment. <laughs> I wouldn't argue them necessarily. No. I mean, there are differences. You know, when you talk about foreign policy and you look at previous administrations, and Sam and I, Sam and I had a conversation about this earlier, is that uh, in retrospect, you know, when you're there in the moment, things like things appear to be going hell in a handbasket. There's so much going on in, in the world today, Ukraine, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, uh, Boko Haram, I mean, name it, it's everywhere. It's Jesus, what's the hell? But I think, think back to other times when we've had almost equal number of things going on simultaneously, but now that we're 10, 20, 40 years away from it, oh, it doesn't seem like it was that bad when we were there. Um, and I think that's perhaps the, mm -hmm. the, the looking through the prism of time that mm -hmm. when we look back on this period, Sam, do you think it's much, much worse now than it was 10, 20, 30 years ago? I think... Uh it has become more complex uh, because of the maturing of various kinds of uh, movements, uh, power, fragmentation of power. It, when there was a larger uh, axis of confrontation in the world with the United States on one side and the Soviet Union on the other side, given, of course, there were a lot of non-aligned countries, uh, it was uh, easier to put the stresses and the threats into a coherent framework, seemingly a coherent framework, in order to establish priorities. Uh, it's more difficult now, no doubt. Uh, in some ways, uh, Putin has simplified things a bit, made it easier. <laughs> and also, interestingly enough, so has uh, ISIS made it a little bit easier to establish priorities. Uh, the Chinese have made it a little bit easier by their bullying tactics in the East and so South China Seas to say, you know, these are major threats. We have to get our priorities straight. We have to make sure that we don't um, give our opponents reason to miscalculate, uh, that we won't stand up for what we say we are for. Um, uh, in some ways, those threats have, uh, have been beneficial uh, for the objective of having a more coherent foreign policy. Uh, but I think, uh, yes, things are more complicated, but they are hardly as, as uh, simple as, in retrospect, they looked. I mean, Eisenhower, for example, um, had to deal with the phenomenon of rising self-determination movements, anti-colonial movements in the Middle East, which confounded our Middle Eastern policy. At the same time that the Soviets were engaging in very brutal uh, actions in Eastern Europe, um, Eisenhower was um, very worried about uh, others catalyzing our involvement in wars uh, which he felt could get out of hand. Uh, looking back at the Eisenhower administration, I have been amazed at how complicated, how complex it was uh, for him, and why a lot of the objections to his policies at the time, in retrospect, we forget about these objections, why a lot of these objections to his policies at the time were so prominent uh, in the debates in Congress, in the newspapers, in the editorial com uh, uh, columns, etc. Yes, sir, you're over here in the front. Mm -hmm. I'll get you next, in the back. Thank you. My name is Stefan Grober. I'm with Euronews European Television. Um, next week, the Prime Minister of Israel uh, comes to town. And I was wondering, uh, what's your take on the evolution of U.S.-Israeli relations over the last six years? There seems to be a big uh, um, uh, perception gap. If you ask uh, people, the intelligence and defense community, they say it has never been closer. Um, and the, of course, the public perception is, is different because of the lack of 
chemistry between uh, President Obama and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. What's, what's your take? Well, it's always been volatile and uh, characterized by ups and downs of tension, of expressions of cooperation. Uh, from the beginning, as I mentioned uh, in the Truman administration, of course. But there's a, the inherent dilemma of U.S. policy in the Middle East, and that is that many of those countries whose cooperation the United States needed during the Cold War, whose cooperation the United States needs now for uh, dealing with terrorism, uh, are uh, not at all friendly toward Israel. Um, this has been a problem all along. Uh, sometimes uh, it became very bitter, as during uh, uh, the Reagan administration over the AWACS uh, issue. Uh, um, very bitter during uh, George Herbert Walker Bush's administration. A lot of tensions having to do with Israeli policies on the West Bank towards settlement and so on. Uh, with Netanyahu, it's been very rocky. Um, and um, uh, is it worse now than it has been? Well, it looks like it's in a more confrontationist phase right now, openly so, than it has been for a long time. Um, the policies toward Iran's nuclear program being a generator on the surface of this, but a lot of the generating pressures come from the domestic political situation in Israel. Sure. Election year politics. Yeah. That's what's going on in uh, Israel. But it's always been up, up and down. And uh, uh, that is a result of the systemic problems that can't be washed away. I think bottom line, though, is we will always be a tremendous ally and protector of Israel. We've said that, all, all administrations have said that, we'll continue to continue that way. Netanyahu, of course, is playing that national card in Iran, and he's going to run it to the election, see what happens next month. Uh, my guess is after the election, regardless of who gets elected, it'll die down. That oop, either he won mm -hmm. or the other did, and, and then mm -hmm. on to the next thing. Of course, the Iran Accord, which could be reached as early as mid-next month, will, could complicate this some, but my guess is that won't happen until after the uh, Israeli election. So it's going to be very interesting. Very good question. All the way in the back. So, Henry Hedger, uh, retired federal government. I, I wonder what your feelings are on sanctions uh, as an effective uh, method of obtaining uh, results in foreign policy disagreements, uh, you know, with another nation. Uh, we've had them with Iran. We now have them on Russia. Uh, we still have them on Cuba, although they may come to an end. There's a question of whether the Congress will approve eliminating them. Uh, do you think this is a, a way of really getting things done, or, or does it increase tensions? Does it decrease them? Uh, does it really solve a problem, or is it to make the other nation crumble uh, internationally and, as a result, get your way uh, in a positive method without war? Um, can, can you have something to say about this with all your learned studies of all these administrations? I don't think there's a a, a uh, simple answer to the question. I think it's always a case specific situation as to what extent the carrots or the sticks of diplomacy need to be uh, applied. And uh, a uh, carrot is a removal of the stick in some cases, or a carrot goes with the removal of the stick. Sanctions uh, can't accomplish a great deal if there are fundamental differences of interest. Uh, but on the other hand, they can make it difficult and help drive countries toward some kind of an accommodation. So I don't think there's a general answer to it. I think that in the tool bag of diplomacy, uh, pressures of various kinds, coercive pressures of various kinds, short of force, uh, have always been a part of uh, the foreign policy of, of countries going all the way back to the founding with the XYZ affair and dealing with France and Britain and so on. And so they're always there and going to have to be drawn upon at times, uh, carefully, pragmatically, but uh, mistakes uh, can be made and, uh, and uh, uh, the uh, hope to find
fundamentally transform a relationship through sanctions very rarely is realized. It can sometimes be just the opposite. Your example is interesting because in the Cuba case, Cuba just kept going on and on and on and still exists today. So you saw what happened the last couple of months in our dealings with Cuba and of course the, even the criticisms of the Obama administration, what we're doing with Cuba today. Um, but look at what sanctions are doing to Iran and clearly bringing them to the table. Uh, whether that's the deciding factor or not, I'm not sure, but they're having an impact. Sanctions on Russia, minimal impact is my personal opinion. That you, you, Okay, you sanction some oligarchs and some others, it's not a big deal. But if they really wanted to, to sanction Russia, they'd cut out their ability to finance internationally, and that would, that would cripple them. But we haven't gone that far yet. Not sure we want to. So, yes, sir, here right in front. Oh, the uh, Sam, when you look at U.S. military engagement... Please speak loud. There you go. When you look at U.S. military engagement from the Korean War to the Vietnam War to Iran, Iraq, and then you look at what happened in 91 when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, it seems the 91 U.S. intervention was the most successful. America came out of the Kuwait exercise more powerful, more admired, less financially broke. Is this a good model to follow? Well, the um, Gulf War was uh, rather easy uh, with respect to what the objectives were, um, the nature of, the, uh, of, of what Saddam had to do. Um, however, um, it almost got complicated, okay? But uh, George Herbert Walker Bush, President Bush, Colin Powell, and so on, pulled it back from that, reversing the aggression, beating back Saddam Hussein out of Kuwait. That was a rather simple, almost traditional uh, use of force. When it came to going on to do a regime change operation, President Bush Number 41 called a halt to that. Didn't want to get, mess, get, get into the messy situation that his son got us into in Operation Iraqi Freedom. Okay. So, um, successful, yes, uh, in comparison with what happened afterwards, but to a large extent the success was the result of the restraint that was put on the objectives of the Gulf War. All the way in the back on the right. Hey, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Justin Goldman with RSIS in Singapore. Um, if you look at uh, rebalance being a main pillar of this administration's approach, compared to past uh, Clinton and Bush 41, where they rolled out an East Asia strategy report, you know, you constantly hear that from allies and partners. Hey, when is a new East Asia strategy report going to come out? Did you find real utility of that during the Clinton and Bush 41 years? Because that's a constant refrain we hear from partners. Thank you. I'm sorry, could um, you make your question a, a so little bit more specific? Did, for did you find in the Clinton and Bush 41 years the utility of putting out an East Asia strategy report to communicate to allies and partners? If the rebalance is a main pillar of this administration, there is no equivalent document being put out as a way to communicate to our allies and partners. Was there an equi- Well, I, I think what you're saying, Justin, is that the Asia pivot that the Obama administration yeah. has touted where there are similarities between uh, Clinton and 41. And they always, that was a capstone. They said, hey, what does it mean? And that, you know, conveyed real clearly. And that was, hey, you want to know it, you pull that off in the shelf. Yeah. Uh, I'm not uh, as familiar with those documents during the Clinton administration dealing with uh, the basic balance of power considerations toward Asia. Do you want to characterize them? Sure, so there were four that came out between 89 and 95. It was just something that kind of, one of the refrains that we do here in the region says, oh, we'll hear a speech from a principal and it'll cover one aspect of the pivot. You know, we'll hear another release. And there's not something that kind of captures it and synthesizes it the way, you know, the strategy reports did. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am, here in the front. Let, let's get you a microphone here. I've taught and written books and so on, but I actually want to 
ask you a question on behalf of uh, Robert Blackwell at the Council on Foreign Relations, the Kissinger Chair app. The Council, ha and, and I have his quote right here, uh, the Council held a meeting right at the time when, when the strategy was, uh, was released, as you may know, and uh, Blackwell's, and for that matter, Janine Davidson's, who joined him, uh, reaction was, this is not a strategy. It may be whatever, it will, generally national security strategies aren't strategic. But then he was specific, and I would like for you to respond to this, if you may. Uh, he says, if strategy can be defined as the means that we use to get others to do what we want, if we do this, it will maximize the likelihood that they will do that. If that is what it means, this national security strategy contains virtually no strategy, no connecting means to ends. It's an essentially an administration vision statement. And then he gives examples. What is the administration strategy to help uh, produce an an effective and unifying Iraqi government? Nothing about that in the discussion. And he then, to end massive killings uh, to Syria, nothing about that, and so forth. And he gives five more examples or so. Um, I wonder if your methodology of looking at the way that presidents looked at issues and they were messy and as, we, as the archives show, they continue to be messy. What does that have to do with the clear impression that a president must give, and they have tended to do in the past, of American resolve and an American sense of we know what, what we're doing? The fact that the council, and Blackwell in particular, sees no such strategy is itself a reality that we have to face. Yeah, Please respond. I, I think the luxury of having a grand strategy, which it appears to me is being called for, uh, occurs rarely in the history of the United States. We did have something that looked like a grand strategy during the Cold War because the threat, the overarching threats could be specified. There are a whole range of objectives that the national interest securing the safety of the American people, their well-being, doing so consistent with our basic uh, liberties, and so on. There are a whole range of policies and strategies for implementing those basic policies that don't amount to a grand strategy. Uh, I wrote an article a number of years ago called The End to Grand Strategy, which essentially made this point. You can have strategies for accomplishing some specific objectives. That larger strategy document that uh, Blackwell was referring to is, I agree, not a strategy. It's a set of aspirations, a set of statements as to what we stand for, but it doesn't indicate the means that have to be selected in order to get to those ends or to ward off threats in a specific enough way to be called a strategy. We use the term strategy loosely uh, for uh, what we want, an Obama doctrine, a Truman doctrine, and so on. But uh, that's not the way the world works. The world works by specific threats, specific instances, specific crises, and responses to those specific crises. The Kennedy administration had a strategy that it evolved for dealing with the Soviet missiles in Cuba. The Kennedy administration didn't have a grand strategy. Okay? Uh, the Eisenhower administration modified some of the military strategies of its predecessor through a new look for a bigger bang for a buck, more reliance on nuclear weapons, okay? But it didn't really have a strategy of specific relationship of means to ends in this broader sense that Ambassador Blackwell is Same Since World War II, has there been any one administration that published a overarching solid national security strategy? There have been calls for it. But the closest, actually, that came to it was a partial strategy. It dealt more with uh, terrorism and um, strategic relationships, was uh, 
the Bush administration's first strategy paper after 9-11. After, uh, um, that, that came closest to a detailed strategy. There, were, there was a national strategy paper produced, an, a basic national security strategy paper produced by various administrations, but it was also very much like the recent one, a set of aspirations rather than uh, an articulation of specific threats and means for dealing with those threats. I, th I, think, I think Sam agrees with, uh, with Bob Blackwell. Yeah. Um, on that note, unfortunately, we are well past our, our hour. So um, I really appreciate everybody coming. Again, I'm going to give you a plug for the book, Faces of Power. You can go on Amazon.com and pick it up, Columbia University Press. And uh, certainly hit our website, AmericanSecurityProject.org. Uh, and I appreciate your support, appreciate you coming today. Thank you very much.